I want to welcome everybody this morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to be talking about the Word of God. And this morning we're going to be looking into the book of Matthew in the fifth chapter. And uh, this is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. If you're familiar with the Bible, you, you know about the Sermon on the Mount and, and some of the teachings that are there. We're going to be looking at those teachings. Uh, we talk about the Beatitudes, and some of you have memorized the Beatitudes. And I just want to point out one thing, that the very word Beatitude deals with attitudes. <laughs> now, we, we say here in our church that we deal with, with attitudes and uh, with our priorities with our motives. So in the Beatitudes, these things are all about our attitude. And starting in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, this is Jesus, seeing multitudes around him, Jesus went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him. Now it's really important for us to start out on the right foot. And so it says he went up on a mountain. We got to get the idea that he departed, he departed from the crowds and went up in a mountain by himself and took his 12 disciples with him. And that's not the case. What this simply is saying is this. Jesus went to a hillside where he was raised up above the other people so that they could look upon him and, and hear his voice. And so he just, maybe it was a small hill, maybe it was the side of a side of a larger hill that he stepped up on and went up on so that... Uh, he could be seen and heard by the multitude that was there. And it says, and his disciples came to him. And once again, we get the idea here that it was the 12 disciples that came to him. But that word disciple doesn't mean the 12. It's not the apostles. That the word disciple means those who want to learn. So this morning, I want you to see that what we're dealing with here is Jesus putting himself in a position so that he could teach and that we, if we want to learn, are the ones that he's teaching. So the whole multitude was hearing what he was saying. And as we read on, that becomes very clear to us that that's true. Are you a disciple? I had someone say to me this past week, well, believers aren't, uh, aren't the same as disciples. And disciples aren't the same as believers. And I, I had to go back into the scripture, you know, and, and point out the fact that if you are a believer in Christ, then you become a disciple of Christ. If you're not a disciple, then it's because you are not truly a believer. A disciple is one who wants to learn from Christ and then do the things that they're taught. If we are truly believers, Jesus said that we are going to hear his words and do the things that he says. So being a believer and being a disciple are one and the same. Now, believing that Jesus was, that Jesus came and died on the cross, and that Jesus rose from the dead, is not necessarily making you a believer. See, the Bible also tells us that the devil believes in God. The devil believes all these things. He was there. He witnessed it all. And yet, he is not a believer in Christ. He's not a disciple of Christ. The Bible says that the devil, the devil trembles at the name of Jesus, uh, most Christians don't because we have uh, learned two things. Number one, that, that God loves us. And number two, we've learned to take for granted some of the awesomeness of our God. But in this first verse, we find out that Jesus lifted himself above so that others could see him. And he was speaking to those who were willing to learn. Am I willing to learn from Christ what he is willing to teach me? And then we'll go from there. And it says, then he opened his mouth and he taught them. You know, sometimes we come into a church and we don't want to be taught. We just hear some good things. We want to maybe hear a nice joke. We want, to tell, we want someone to tell us all the good things that God is doing. And God is doing great things, by the way. Praise God. One of the greatest things God has ever done for us is to send his son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Because without that, there would be no hope for us, and all the other promises would be meaningless. That one, what, that one act that Jesus did by coming and dying on the cross has made all of the other promises in the Word of God worthwhile. I mean, what good would it be for us to, to have kingdoms, and, and what good would it be for us to prosper in everything 
if we died in our sins and we went to hell anyway. So that one promise eclipses it, all the others and, and it just outshines everything that God has done on, on the, along with that. So he opened his mouth and he began to teach them. He taught them. He wasn't just talking at them. He wasn't just sharing good things with them. He was teaching them. And the Word of God tells us that we need to be taught. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, we are told, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That the Word of God is there for us to teach us and to, to take the difference between what's going on in our heart and in our, so, our spirit, and divide that up. So, uh, what's the difference between my spirit and my soul? And in the Bible, uh, two completely different words. Talking about your soul is talking about the way that you reason. The way that you think about things. That's your soul. And when we are saved, it says we save our soul. It is an eternal, eternal thing, but it is saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Our spirit, then is that life that God has given to us. It is life in itself, and it is what communicates with, with God in life. And so those two things are, are two different things that we, that we have as part of our own makeup. So we have to, this, this thing going about that between the soul and the spirit that the Word of God divides. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says we have, need to cast down imaginations. That's what's going on in our soul. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So anything that seems to be greater than or replacing the, the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Anything that gets in our hearts and in our minds that we, that we allow to just pull the, the power of God's word out of us. And there are some things out there. I, I see people who, they get involved in, in maybe studying some things that studying maybe should be staying away from. But what those things do is they start to diminish our ideas and our thoughts about God's power, about God's authority, about the truthfulness of the Word of God. Those things are, are things that, that tear us apart and, and destroy our faith and pull us away from God. So we need to be careful when we're, what we're allowing to be, come into us, what we're being taught. We have to be careful what, what the world is teaching us, what other people are teaching us. You have to be careful what pastors like myself are teaching because those, those things which are contrary to the Word of God are, are heresy, and they need to be put aside. See, we're told to try the spirits, try the spirits, and hold fast to those things which are good, and cast out those things which are not. He says, don't despise prophesying, prophesying but when you hear someone prophesying, uh, you, you need to take it and you need to relate it to the Word of God, say, does this fit into God's Word, compare it to what God has already said in His Word, if it does not, cast it out. If it holds true to the Word of God, then take it, meditate upon it, upon it, and see how God is relating that portion of the Word to your life through that prophecy. So these are the things that are really important for us as, as believers, as disciples of, of Christ who are willing to be taught. So Jesus went up on the mountain and he began to teach those disciples, those people who are willing to be taught, we're going to pick up again here in chapter 5 and verse 3. It said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Again, blessed. That word blessed means to be happy, to be overjoyed. And the word are in your Bible, if you have a King James Version of the Bible, there you'll see that that word are is in italics. And when you see a word that is in, ta in italics in your Bible... That means that there was really no Hebrew or Greek word in the original text there, but it was placed in there by the translators to try to add some understanding of that scripture. Okay? But the word, the word R is one of those. So if we read it without it, it says, Blessed the poor in spirit. And if we look at the word blessed, we find that that word blessed is not necessarily a matter of present time, but is a matter of uh, of growing into or moving into. So what we see here, if we take the word R out of there, uh, which, was, which was added, 
When we see blessed, the poor in spirit, we can say blessed become the poor in spirit. Happy are happy become those who are poor in spirit. And again, the word poor in spirit here, going back and you say, well, this is kind of tedious, Pastor. We're getting onto all these words, but it's important that we understand the word of God in its entirety and exactly what it said. The poor in spirit are those people who understand. Remember, the spirit is, is our life. So those who understand that without God within them, their lives have become empty. And so they desire to have more of God's spirit within them, more of God's word within them, because this, the word brings spirit and life. So the, when we get more of God's word in us, when we hunger for more of God's word, when we desire it because we recognize that without it, we're nothing. If we think of ourselves as something uh, more than we are, if we think that we have it together, we think that, well, we know all the answers, we're only deceiving ourselves. But when we recognize that if it's not for the Word of God and what the Holy Spirit is giving us through the Word of God, we become empty shells. But with the Word of God in us and with the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, we become something that is worthwhile. And so he says, for those who understand their emptiness without the Spirit of God, the implication here is that they are going to seek more of God's word, seek more of the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or, as we read again in the Greek there, it says, theirs, uh, they are the kingdom of heaven. So, when we recognize that we need the Holy Spirit within us, we recognize that we need the word of God in us, the kingdom of heaven comes into us, and we become part of what God is doing. If, we're, if that's not there, we can't become part of what God is doing. And it brings joy to our hearts to know that we are in one accord with God and that we're useful to Him. And we're able to be, uh, He's able to use us to, to meet the, the needs of other people. He's able to use us to bring the gospel out to, to those who need to hear it. Uh, that brings joy and happiness in our hearts. That, in the next verse it says, verse 4, it says, Blessed are they to become happy that mourn because they will be comforted. And that sounds an oxymoron. When we recognize our emptiness spiritually and we seek more for the Word of God and we seek more for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we become sorrowful about our lives and we become sorrowful about what's going on around us. And so in our practice of seeking out God and seeking out His Word, He comforts us. He shows us that it is not our deeds, number one, that make us righteous it's not what we have done or what we are doing that makes puts us in right relationship with God, but it is in what God is doing in us and through us that puts us in that right relationship. So in understanding that I, I fail all the time, you know, you understand that we're not, uh, we're not perfect in any way. I, I've heard some ministers say that, well, when the Holy Spirit came and moved into you, you don't sin anymore. And I just have to say, you know, give the... The, the Greek word for that is it's hogwash because we don't become perfect and we're not going to be perfect until the day that we stand before God in his perfection in the kingdom of God and he puts us into his kingdom in the heavenly kingdom. In the meantime, we have these trials that we have to face every day. In the meantime, we have failures. There are times when, when our minds get caught up on some things that we shouldn't get caught up on and it drags us away from God and we start to doubt some of God's word. We start to think that maybe, well, that maybe that word's not for today. Maybe that was for, you know, 2,000 years ago, but it's not really for today. And, and we get these ideas in us that pull us away from the word of God. Or we do some things that after we've done them or after we've said some things that we wish that we hadn't done them because we recognize that they were just not the right thing. And so it causes grief within us. And that, that word mourn means to be grief-stricken. That we get grief within us recognizing that we are not what we should be. We are not where we ought to be. We haven't made it yet. You know, Paul talks later on in his in his uh, ministry, as he as he's gone through a number of things, he says, you know, I, he says, I, I don't act like I've already made it. He says, no, I'm, I just keep pressing on. I pre keep pressing on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ. I haven't made it yet. I'm still working on this thing. In fact, Paul, late in his in his ministry, said, calls himself the chiefest among sinners. Well, what does that mean? 
That simply means that he, is, he was more aware of his inabilities as he became closer and closer to Jesus Christ and seeing the perfection of God, of God in Christ. And see, when we get close to the Lord, when we draw closer to Jesus and we see the brightness of his glory and we see the glory that's around him and we see how perfect he is in all things, our imperfections start to stand out. And our, our thought patterns, which are not in, in line with the Word of God, start to be made evident. And we start to see that the only good things that we have in life are those things which God is doing in us and through us. It's not the things that we are doing for Him, but it's the things that He is doing in us. So, when, when we're thinking of ourselves highly, when we start bragging and we start talking about all the things that we've done and all the accomplishments that we've made for, for Christ, all we're doing is we're refusing to recognize that we are still in the process of being perfected, that there's much in us that needs to be changed. And I can tell you from experience, there is much in me that needs to be changed changed much that God needs is to needs to take away more that God needs to put into me and so number one is we, we see ourselves as spiritually poor that we can't be anything without the Holy Spirit without the Word of God we see ourselves then as inadequate and we are grieved over that he says blessed are the they that mourn for they shall be comforted and our comfort comes in knowing that God in his forgiveness and in his love and in his mercy forgives us of sin as we repent of it and pulls us in to his family, draws us into the kingdom of God and makes us one of his children. That comforts us because it says, you know, I don't have to earn this position. I don't have to earn my place in God's presence. But God is giving it to me simply because I have become available to the Holy Spirit to work in me. And so in the midst of my, of my failures, in the midst of my falling down, God's goodness and grace and mercy are there to lift me up and brush me off and start me over again and comfort me and bind up my wounds and encourage me to move on. So blessed are those who mourn. Blessed you become as you recognize who you are, what you are, and how and what God is, and who God and what He does, and how that affects you. Remember, our attitude is our uh, the way that we view the importance of God, and the way that we view the importance of ourselves. And if I view my own importance as really great, and the, the view the importance of God as as lesser, something out there that well, maybe someday I'm going to have to get right with, we're going to end up doing things wrongly in life. But if I view myself as empty and without the ability to do righteous things, without God doing them in me, well, then I'm going to see that my life becomes better and becomes stronger. As we move on to the third of the blessings in, in the Beatitudes, we see that it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that word meek there is, is just means a person who is humble. And I'm not talking about false humility. A false humility is something that people put on. It's like a mask that they put on, which really does not convey their heart. But a humble person doesn't act real lowly. A humble person just treats other people as though they matter. And they treat God as though he is God. And that, that he is the creator and he is worthy of our praise and he is worthy of our attention and he is worthy of our time and he is worthy of our, our obedience. A person who is humble doesn't necessarily go around demeaning themselves, but what they do is they go around and they lift up other people. They help other people. So that's what it's saying. So when we start to lift up other people and we increase the 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 worth of other people in our own hearts and in the way we act and the way we talk and we look to God as though he is all supreme in everything it says then we shall inherit 
what God has created, inherit the earth. In other words, when, when, I, when I treat others and I treat God with the due respect that is due each one of them individually, that God in, re, in turn gives to me the things that I have need of here. He puts me in a place where I am able to help more. You know, one of the things about, uh, about prosperity, that God will prosper us as we use the prosperity that we now have to help other people. God never talked about prosperity for the believers to build up big bank accounts or to buy bigger houses or to drive fancier cars. God talked about the prosperity in the kingdom of God. Number one, success is knowing that your life is worthwhile to God because you are walking according to his will. Prosperity simply means that I am content with what God has given to me and I'm happy with what God has given to me and I'm using what God has given to me to bless other people. A person who is truly content with what God has given and the person who is using what God has given to them to bless other people is prosperous. You can have millions and millions of dollars and other, and other people look at you and say, boy, that, what a prosperous person. But if you're not content with that and if you're hoarding it for yourself and all you're doing is worrying about other people getting it from you, you can't call yourself a prosperous or a successful individual because you're spending all of your time in worry. But when you, have, when you take what God has given to you, you're content with it and you're willing to share it with those around you give to those who are in need, then you have prosperity. So the Bible says that those who esteem others, the, the humble, the meek, who esteem others greater than themselves, who look at God with all of his glory and, and, and see him in all of, of all of his majesty and what he is worth to us, and inherit, the Bible says here, inherit the earth. As we inherit those things which God has given to us that pertain to all life and godliness. God takes care of us. Jesus says later on in this book, he says, what, what, why worry about what you're going to eat and, and what, you're, what you're going to wear? Doesn't, hasn't God uh, given the, the flowers of the field the beauty that they have? And he says, not even Solomon and all of his wealth and all of his wisdom wasn't arrayed with all of the beauty that God has given to flowers. And he says, look at the sparrows. They don't go out and plow the field and, and, and plant seed and harvest it. But every day, God feeds them. The people that worry about these kind of things are people who are not having faith in God. He, calls, he says these are the, the sinners, the heathens, the Gentiles, the unbelievers. They're the people who are worried about these kind of things. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just sit back and not do anything with our lives. Of course, and he says that we should eat by the, the sweat of our brow. So it is our job to take care of the things that God has given to us to use the opportunities accepted for us, to take care of ourselves and our families and so forth. But the thing is this, if we worry about those things all the time, we are not trusting God. We're not trusting Him at all. So when we see life as what God has given to us and we're content with that and we're willing to share with those who have need out of what we have, God says, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to continue to give to them all that they have need of. So, that's what being mourning, or that's what being meek and inheriting the, the earth is talking about. Then we see, it says, Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now the word hunger here means hunger. And the word thirst means thirst. And the word hunger, the words hunger and thirst means there's things that we have need of. We have need of food. We have need of, of water in our lives. Without them, we die. Without them, we cease to exist. So he says, those people who have this need, this, this desire, like we have a desire for food and water just to exist, people who have this desire uh, for righteousness, and the word righteousness here means, as we've spoken in the past, means that we are in right standing with God. That we have a good relationship with our Father, the Creator. If we desire, as much as we desire food and water, because our very lives depend upon it, to be in a right relationship with the Father, 
he says, then we'll be filled. Now, being filled here is not, is not talking about being filled physically, like being, having your bellies full. But it means being filled in your life, your entire life full, full of the goodness of God, full of the joy, full of the peace, full of the love, full of the power of God, the Holy Spirit filling you up to overflowing. It's for those who have this sincere need, the sincere desire hungering and thirsting for a right relationship with God. Well, what, what does that mean? I, you know, well, I, I want a better relationship with God. You know, that, you know, God knows that. No, it's not just wanting it, but having this hunger and thirst means that we're going after it. We're going, we're going, we're pursuing it. We're putting our life into achieving this right relationship with God. How many of us actually spend more than maybe just a few minutes every day, searching out the Word of God. Not just trying to search out one word or, or trying to find a particular uh, verse that we had heard and, and want to find it again. Or not just praying and asking God to bless us and bless our families and do these things for us that we want. But spending the time to get to know God by sincere study of His Word. By praying things that that are toward God and not from not asking God to do things for me. You know, I've often asked the people here in the church to take some time, take one day, or if, you, if, if possible, take more than one day each week and pray to God without asking Him for anything. Spend your time in prayer and don't ask God for anything unless you're going to ask Him to help you draw closer to Him. But don't ask Him for anything. And just spend that time worshiping and praising Him and, and being grateful for what He has already done and lifting His name as we've sung these songs of praise this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, He is, he is our, our shelter, our high tower. You know, the, we sing these songs about how great God is. How great is our God. How great is our God. If we just took some time just between us and God Getting to know Him. Not telling Him what we want. Not trying to find something where God says, well, this is what I'm going to do for you. But just getting to know the heart of God. See, that's what it means, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He says, you become happy, you become blessed, when you have this attitude of needing to know God more fully, where you pursue God, like you would, like a hungry man would pursue something to eat, or a man dying of thirst would pursue wanting a drink, you know, getting some cold or cool fresh water. That we would pursue God with that same attitude. God tells us, Jesus said this, He said, unless you love me, more than you love your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your children, even your own life, you're not worthy of me. See, unless we, unless we love God with, with such a fervor, then we can't really expect God to bless us the way that we want Him to bless us, to be filled. You know, we talk about, well, people are filled with the Spirit. And, and they are. They become filled with the Holy Spirit. And when people become filled with the Holy Spirit, what happens to them is this, that the Holy Spirit overflows in their life. And there is joy showing from them. And, you know, I can tell you uh, from, from my experience that when I, when I committed my life to Christ and I was filled with the Holy Spirit, there became such a hunger in my life for the Word of God. I just wanted to sit down and read it. I didn't want to just read it. I wanted to read it and I wanted to write notes about it. I, I went out and got a, a concordance you know, and I just wanted to look up the meanings of the words and I wanted to know more about God. I wanted to know more about what He said. I wanted to know more about His character. I wanted to know if scriptures really did contradict one another. And they don't, by the way. I have been challenging people for years. Show me a scripture that contradicts another scripture. And, with, and, uh, and I will be gladly talk to you about that. And I will gladly admit, if you're right, but I have never had anybody be able to do it. Because Scripture does not contradict, contradict Scripture. 
Circumstances are changed from one place to another, but Scripture never contradicts, contradicts Scripture. There are laws set down which govern governments. There are different laws that are set down which govern individuals. So when you see different laws out there, you say, well, you know, the Bible says that, uh, uh, that those who commit certain crimes are guilty and they should be killed. But then it says, thou shalt not kill. And then again, there's another uh, word there that should have been translated murder because that's exactly what the, uh, the Hebrew word meant, to murder someone, take an innocent life. And there are those who then say, well, capital punishment is wrong. And because we, and in, because Jesus said, you know, even if you hate, hate your brother without cause, that you're guilty of committing murder. The thing is this, one law is given by government, the other, or given to the government. Another law is given to an individual. And Paul goes on and he clarifies that. He, he says that God has set up governments, kings and governors, as his emissaries to carry out his vengeance. He says he didn't give them the sword for no reason. That God gave the government the right to carry out God's vengeance upon criminals, upon evildoers. So we have these different things. The, the, the word of God does not contradict the word of God. here. So those who hunger and seek after righteousness, he says they shall be filled. We, we get full of God's goodness, full of God's power, full of God's love, full of God's graciousness. We become humble. We become kind. We become gentle. We become powerful. We become forceful. We become wise. We become all of these things that's filling us up because we're getting closer and closer and closer to God. But we also, at the same time, we become more grief-stricken because we see of our own lacking. And we be, but we become more comforted because we see of God's grace. So all of these things fill us up. We just get full of, of God and, and everything that he's doing because we hungered and thirsted after righteousness. In verse 7, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And there's no reason to translate these words any differently than what you see. If I show mercy to someone else, God shows mercy to me. Later on, we're going to read, as in this same book, how that Jesus spoke to his disciples, and they came and they said, you know, the disciples to be of John the Baptist have, have learned how to pray, because John taught them how to pray. And so could you teach us how to pray? And Jesus gave what we now call the Lord's Prayer. And it says in there, and forgive my sins as I have forgiven those who sin against me. See, it doesn't say, forgive my sins, and then I will forgive those who sin against me. It says, forgive my sins as I have forgiven those who sin against me. Here it says, you become happy when you allow mercy to flow into you and flow through you, because when that happens, the mercy of God flows into you. When you put forth mercy toward other people, maybe someone has wronged you, and you have every right to, to get back at them but you're going to show mercy. Here it says, if you are merciful, then God in return shows his mercy to you, and it brings joy into your life. Doesn't it bring joy into your life to know that God is merciful enough that he's going to forgive your sins? Doesn't that give you joy? It gives me joy. Sometimes I get so overwhelmed with the joy uh, of God and the, and the grief of my own sins that it just... It just Comes all consuming to me. I, I find myself sometimes just weeping over the understanding that I don't deserve God's mercy. I don't deserve His grace. And I don't deserve any of the blessings that He's given to me because my life is not a deserving life. But He is such a gracious and good God. And, and I don't understand why He would even want to love people like me. And why he would want to be merciful to people like me. But he is. And it brings joy. And it brings peace in knowing that it's not because I did something great and, and made God happy because I did something. But it's because God is great. And he is doing it. It makes him happy to be able to be merciful to me and forgiving to me. That, that he gets 
he gets pleasure from me recognizing how great and merciful and kind he is. So when we show that mercy to other people, God's mercy is poured out to us. Hallelujah. Blessed are the pure in heart. I know that this is really hard, people. I really do know that this is hard. Brothers and sisters, uh, I'm going I'm to tell you what, I don't even know some of you, but I can tell you as a matter of fact, our hearts are not always pure. Sometimes our hearts are vengeful. Sometimes our hearts are selfish. Sometimes our hearts are led away by desires for things in this world. Our hearts are not always pure. That's when we go back to the mercy of God. And we repent and we seek God. That's when we go back to seeking for the righteousness of God. It's because we recognize the grief in knowing that we're not, we're not always pure in heart. And so we go to God and we repent of sin. And we ask God to change our thinking. Bringing, every, bringing down every imagination and every thought that rises up against the knowledge of God. Putting it under subjection to Christ. See, only the Holy Spirit has the right and has the ability to change the heart of a man. Men can't do it. I want to tell you, you try to change your own heart and it's not going to happen. Because sooner or later, something is going to catch your eye. Something is going to enter into your life and your heart is going to become self-centered again. And your, and your mind is going to wander into things of this world again. Only the Holy Spirit can make your heart, your intents pure. Can give you an attitude that says God is more important than I am. And I want to do God's will versus my will. I want to serve God with all of my heart. He says, blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. Don't you want to see God? Don't you want to be able to stand before God in his presence and his kingdom? Stand there in his, and, and just worship him and glorify God by him and, and know that this is the one who created all things and he created you and me and he put life within us and he put these hearts in us and he gave us the ability to love and he gave us the ability to, to rejoice and he gave us laughter and he gave us the ability to produce children that give to, give to us happiness. He gives to us the, the trees and the sun and the rain and the snow and the flowers and the birds and all that's out there. But this is the one, this mighty God sitting in the throne of God as we are before him. That he is the one who had such mercy upon us. That when we were still sinners, he sent his son to die for us. I want to see God. I want to, I want to be before him and I, want to, I just want to fall on my face before him. And, and I, I just want to love him. And tell him how much I appreciate the fact that he loved me. In person. Not that we can't do it now, we can. But I want to see him. He said, blessed are those whose hearts are pure because they will see God. And then he says in verse 9, and we're going to end with verse 9 this morning. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers. The reason I want to end with this, and I may pick up again with it next week, is that we see in our society right now today, people who just want to stir up trouble. We, we see people who, who are, all they want to do is, if they see there's an issue uh, between two other individuals, they will get in there and they will try to stir that situation up to the point where these two people who maybe have an issue with one another and could be easily taken care of, that they become angry and vengeful against one another. We see it in our society. When one person stands up and says, this is what I want. And another person stands up and says, you don't deserve it. And this is what I want. And we back and forth. We see it amongst our politicians. We see it in every area of society, on the job. People who want to tear down other people to make themselves look good. There are people out there who just, they'll listen to the problem and they'll agree with both sides. 
because they know that by agreeing with side A, they're gonna, it's gonna enforce them in being angry with side B, and then they're going to agree with side B, knowing that it's just gonna reinforce them and make them be more angry with side A, and they just back and forth. And they say, well, I'm not, I'm not carrying any tales, I'm not gossiping or anything, I'm just listening to them and, and, and agreeing with them. That's not being a peacemaker, my friend. See, being a peacemaker is a person who will look for a way to reconcile two sides. Who will try to diminish the, the impact of one, one person's wrongdoing so that it doesn't need to be retributed by the other side. A peacemaker is a person who will stand between two opposing forces and speak wisdom and give to those two, those two opposing forces a reason to come together and work together to right the wrongs that are done. That's what a peacemaker is. We don't have very many peacemakers in our society and we need more of them. We need more people who are willing to say, well, you know what? That side is not always right, and that side over there is not always right. But you know what? Neither one of them are always wrong. And so let's see if we can take the, and, and work out the differences here so that we can work together. Let's, let's look and see what God has to say about these issues. You know, once we decide that God's word is supreme, that God's law surpasses all other laws, then whenever we see problems, we can go right back to the Word of God and we can say, here's what God said. And when I stand before God in judgment, He's not going to ask me what I thought about these situations. He's going to ask, how did I uphold His will in the midst of this circumstance? How did I exemplify Him? How did I, how did I stand there and, and be an example of Christ in the midst of a circumstance? And that's what's going to count for me or against me in the kingdom of God. All of my sins are, and that I've repented of are under the blood of Christ. And I don't need to worry about those. But how I live for Christ is what God is going to judge us on. And so when we determine that God's word and God's law is supreme. And man's ideas and man's law must be subservient to what God has said. Then making... Peace between opposing forces doesn't become such a big chore because we can always go back to the one who makes perfect laws and perfect judgments and say this is what, the God, what God said. Now let's see how we on both sides can fit into what God has said. He said you can be happy being a peacemaker because you're going to be called a child of God. See, going to church doesn't make you a child of God. Living for Christ makes you a child of God. Letting His blood wash away our sins. Determining that we are going to love Him more than we love anything else. And that we're going to obey Him. That we're going to hunger and thirst for that right relationship with Him. These things are all, are all things that bring us to that place of being called the child of God. But it has to come out in the things that we say and the things we do. We can't go along with what the world is saying and doing. We, just, we cannot just agree with everybody out there who, who has a, a, some kind of a vent to make. We can't just go along with them. We might, we might agree with what they said. But what they are saying generally is not going to fix the problem. What's going to fix the problem is if we can get people to agree together that God's will is, is right. And we can, we can obey His will. So blessed are those of you who are peacemakers. There's very few of you out there. God bless you. Because you are called the children of God. But this morning I just want to encourage you to go back over these verses of the blessings. And, and look at the blessing as something that we are attaining and look at whether or not we are fitting into those people that are being listed there and how we can better fit into that. 
And then see the results, see the blessings that come because of fitting into that. And recognize that there are only a few things that need to be done. Number one, we need to repent of sin. Number two, we need to recognize that we are sinful. And let that grief drive us to, fall, to serving and, and seeking out the will of God. And draw closer to Him. Spend more time with God, not just time telling Him what we want. And then let the Holy Spirit within us work through us to do the work of Christ in us so that he will be glorified. Take those beatitudes and see, is this my attitude? And then seek God to help us to bring down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Every, every thought, every, every word, bring it down and put it in its place. And get it out of our lives. Amen.